to uh, call um, this uh, meeting of the Environment Public Works Committee to order. We welcome our guests and um, look forward to a, a productive, uh, productive uh, business meeting. Today, as you know, our committee will vote on whether to move to the uh, full Senate to outstanding nominees for offices within the Department of Commerce and the Environmental uh, Protection Agency. Those votes will take place in just uh, a few minutes. After uh, that voting is uh, concluded, we'll uh, proceed to hold a hearing on the nomination of Michael Lee Connor to serve as Assistant uh, Secretary uh, of the Army for Civil Works. Let me first uh, say a few words about the two nominees whom the committee will vote on uh, here shortly. And they are uh, Al Alejandra Castillo, who has been nominated to serve as Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Economic Development, and uh, Ms. Jane Nishida, who has been nominated to serve as the EPA Assistant Administrator for Tribal and International Affairs. They are exceptional individuals and are well prepared to serve in the positions to which they have been nominated. Both are established federal government leaders. If confirmed, they will bring decades of leadership experience to EPA and, the, and to the Economic Development Administration. We had the opportunity, as you'll recall, to hear uh, from each of them at our hearing last month, and both of them did, I thought, an exceptional job of demonstrating why they've earned the respect and confidence not uh, only of uh, our president, but also with, uh, from so many other former executive branch colleagues on both sides, both sides of the aisle. I'm grateful that uh, both of them have agreed to serve our country once again, and I urge uh, our colleagues to support their confirmations. Now I'd like to turn to uh, Michael Connor, who's sitting right in front of us along with his daughter and his wife. Uh, I want to turn to Michael, from whom we will hear today uh, President Biden has nominated Mr. Connor to serve as Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works. As we all know, this is a critical leadership position for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The Corps of Engineers Civil Works Program is the nation's primary provider of water resources uh, infrastructure. And with more extreme weather events and our changing climate, that work has never been more important to ensure that we're building resilient infrastructure that protects uh, the American people whom we represent. And protecting the American people is particularly critical to those who need help the most. And they include uh, communities of color as well as rural, tribal, and ec economically disadvantaged communities across our country. As a descendant of the Taos Pueblo, Mr. Connor uh, brings a unique perspective and has built a career advocating for Indian country and tribal water rights. He understands the importance of reaching those communities that have not benefited enough from federal investments, and he knows how to do it. Mr. Connor has the experience and character to be successful in this role. During the Obama administration, he served as Deputy Secretary of the Interior, where he managed complex natural resources challenges for the benefit of our nation. He's proven himself to be a capable leader and is more than ready to meet the robust and varied responsibilities of this position to which he's been nominated. If confirmed, Mr. Connor will lead efforts that dramatically impact every corner of this country, from coastal to inland to rural communities. And all of these regions have unique water challenges from navigation to flood control to ecosystem restorations, all of which are managed by the Army Corps. If confirmed, Mr. Connor will have to balance a wide range of complex and critical interests. To better ensure that he is successful in doing so, I uh, recommend that he visit as many of these um, communities throughout uh, our country uh, as possible in order to garner a broader understanding of the challenges that they face. And he must uh, meet all those demands with limited resources. Due to the persistent underfunding in recent years, the backlog of authorized but not completed projects has grown to $109 billion. That's more than 15 times the agency's annual operating budget. That should be something of concern to all of us. The Corps uh, Cor shares responsibility for water infrastructure investments, with state and local governments, and this shortfall is uh, clear evidence that the federal government has not been holding up our end of the bargain for some time. With that said, there is no simple solution to this problem as we know. And should he be confirmed, though, Mr. Connor will quickly become a key figure in endeavoring to ensure that bipartisan concerns about core funding and priorities are addressed. 
And I look forward to hear, hearing his thoughts on these and other important matters. And with that, I'm happy to turn uh, uh, our attention to our ranking member, Senator Capito, for her opening remarks. Senator Capito, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thanks for calling this business meeting and hearing today. First, I would like to speak briefly on the two nominations that we are voting on today. I am pleased to support the nomination of Alejandro Castilla to be Assistant Secretary for EDA at the Department of Commerce, an important position for my state. I appreciated Ms. Castilla's support for some of the key initiatives that impact my state, particularly broadband development. I'm also pleased to vote in favor of reporting the nomination of Jane Nishida to be Assistant Administrator for International and Tribal Affairs at the Environmental and uh, Protection Agency. I appreciate the service Ms. Nishida Ms. Nishida has given over the years and her responsiveness to my questions for the record. We also gather today to consider the nomination of Michael Connor to serve as Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works. Welcome, Mr. Connor. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you earlier this week. As you agreed during our conversation, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers can and should improve its operations and more efficiently deliver important water resources projects, both in West Virginia and across our country. Tasked with overseeing the Corps Civil Works Program, the Assistant Secretary position for which you are nominated is integral to decisions pertaining to our nation's water resources and infrastructure. The Corps' activities through navigation, flood risk management, and ecosystem restoration enable economic growth, save lives, and support conservation. In 2019, approximately 2.3 short tons of waterborne commerce moved in the United States facilitated by our nation's ports and an inland waterway systems dredge constructed and maintained by the Corps. It actually goes right by my house about a quarter of a mile too. This includes uh, everything from energy commodities to the goods Americans depend on in their lives every day. The Corps' flood risk management activities provided $348 billion in benefits to the national economy in 2019 alone. There are, in addition to other important mission areas, from hydropower to recreation and environmental infrastructure. These projects and activities are authorized and directed under the Biennial Water Resources Development Act, we call it WERDA, uh, which is legislation developed by this committee. As I stated at our most recent meeting, I look forward to building on the bipartisan consensus that we have already achieved on water and surface transportation infrastructure legislation in this committee and moving a WERDA bill to enactment. The cooperation of the Assistant Secretary's Office will be integral to this process, as well as the ability of this committee to track implementation of prior word or legislation. That being said, I am troubled by language included in support documents for the President's fiscal year 2022 budget that devalues investments in core projects that facilitate American energy independence. This will have real world impacts for my state of West Virginia, and as we learned from a core stakeholder at a recent meeting will hinder development of key infrastructure and energy projects, like offshore wind projects, critical to this administration's professed climate goals. I am also very concerned about this administration's recent decision to replace and repeal the 2020 Navigable Waters Protection Rule, as well as the lack of transparency in the decision-making process and the rationale provided by the Corps and the EPA. Underpinning the administration's decision were several assertions that have yet to be substantiated by evidence of practical environmental harm. Instead, the absence of federal jurisdiction is cited as de facto evidence of environmental harm. It also remains unclear which stakeholders were consulted prior to the, making this decision. I look forward to hearing Mr. Connor's views on these matters and other issues pertaining to the Corps. His years of experience, and the chairman uh, enumerated those, both in the private sector this body and in leadership positions at the Department of Interior speak to his capability and knowledge of water resource issues. The missions of the Corps and the Bureau of Reclamation do differ in certain respects, and I hope to learn more about how he will approach this important position for which he is nominated. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Thank you so much. Uh, now I uh, like to call up uh, two presidential nominations on which we'll vote uh, on block. The first, uh, I call up presidential nomination 490. Alejandro Castillo of New York to be Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Economic Development. And second, I want to call up presidential nomination 538, Jane Nishida of Maryland to be the Assistant Administrator for International and Tribal Affairs of the Environment, uh, Environmental Protection Agency. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You may want to turn on your, your microphone. I, I had the opportunity to get to know both individuals, and I just want to say that uh, they are excellent choices. Uh, I've had extensive conversations with both of them, and I'm looking forward to serving with them. Good. Thank you very much. I know they appreciate that. I do, too. Okay. Any, anyone else? All right. Hearing none, I, I move to approve and report these nominations favorably to the Senate. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Uh, all opposed say nay. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have the nominations are favorably reported. And the voting portion of this meeting is uh, concluded. I just want to thank everyone for being here and allowing us to get off to a good start today. And uh, if uh, I would just say to our guests, if, uh, if some of our colleagues get up and leave, it's not because they're not interested in, <laughs> in, in what you have to say, nor the importance of your job that, for which you've been nominated. But uh, we all serve on three or four or five committees, and they're trying to do, uh, cover a lot of bases all at once. So we'll let, uh, we'll let, uh, let them. All right. Now, um, uh, unless there's objection, I want to turn the page and uh, move on to our hearing. I'd like to invite a witness, uh, Michael Connor, to the table, please. Mr. Connor's been joined by his uh, wife uh, of um, how many years? <laughs> this is their first question. And you're, you're, you're 32, not under oath. 32 and counting, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> 35 right here, and my wife says it's the happiest five years of her life. <laughs> we thank uh, your wife for joining you today. Thank you for sharing your, your husband with, uh, with us, and I want to especially thank uh, your daughter. You may want to introduce her as well. Go ahead. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, President uh, Biden has nominated Mr. Conner to be the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works. Uh, if confirmed to this office, Mr. Conner's duties will include overseeing the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Among its uh, many areas of responsibility, the Corps is responsible for responding to and reducing the likelihood of flood damage and restoring our degraded ecosystems. The uh, Corps' civil works program includes the construction and operation and maintenance of our nation's ports and inland waterways, which are the gateway to both domestic and international commerce. It also includes shoreline and coastal protections for the areas of our country dramatically affected by large bodies of water. Mr. Connor comes to this nomination with years of public service experience, having served as staff to the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, our sister committee, and as a senior leader, leader at the Department of the Interior. When it was the secretary, it was a Ken Salazar, the secretary, when you were there? Ken Salazar was the secretary, then Sally uh, Jewell. Yeah, a real colleague. Old cop and friend. From 20, uh, 2009 to 2014, Mr. Connor led the Bureau of Reclamation as its commissioner, and from 2014 to 2017, he served as the Deputy Secretary of the Interior. Mr. Connor is now a partner at Wilmer Hale Law Firm. So, Mr. Connor, we welcome you and would invite you to please proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, distinguished members of the committee. I'm honored to appear before you today as President Biden's nominee to be the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works. I'm grateful and appreciative of your consideration of my nomination. Mr. Chairman, I think I missed my cue earlier, so I will take care of that now. Um, thank you for the opportunity to recognize my wife, Sherry, and my daughter, Gabriella. Gabriella, Gabriella, I just said to Gabriella, I love that name, that's such a beautiful name. <laughs> um, they, along with my son, Matthew, who couldn't be here today, I've made sacrifices that have allowed me the opportunity to engage in public service for many years. And so I continue to deeply appreciate their support. The Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works is an important position under any circumstances, given the responsibilities of the Corps of Engineers for infrastructure, ecosystem health, maintaining waterways, managing flood risks, and protecting wetlands. These are incredibly important functions for communities across the nation. Today, these responsibilities take on new significance amid the, pa the backdrop of a, a pandemic-impacted economy and they, that must also build resiliency in the face of climate change, while also ensuring equity amongst the communities being served. I am humbled to be nominated to work with the military leadership 
of the Corps and the talented civilian workforce to carry out these important responsibilities. I also believe I am well prepared to address the challenges ahead given my ex extensive experience both inside and outside of government. As a former Deputy Secretary of the Interior and Commissioner of the Bureau of Reclamation, I directed strategy and managed a large uh, federal water resources agency responsible for programs and facilities similar to those of the Corps. These positions also provided significant management experience. As the Chief Operating Officer at Interior, I was responsible for 70,000 employees and an annual budget in excess of $13 billion. At Reclamation, I managed over 5,000 employees uh, with an annual budget in excess of $1 billion. My prior uh, positions also provided extensive experience working directly with the Corps of Engineers. At Reclamation, we collaborated in developing climate resilience strategies, coordinating flood control and water management operations, protecting endangered, endangered species and engaging in river restoration, and uh, advancing dam safety risk management efforts. As Deputy Secretary, I work with the Corps in its role as a regulator, and even collaborated on an international issue involving uh, some poorly maintained infrastructure that was impacting the United States' interests in the Middle East. And as counsel to the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, I didn't stay in my lane and I worked on numerous initiatives related to the Corps. I believe this experience, coupled with my background as both an engineer and a lawyer, provide a unique uh, set of qualifications to be an effective Assistant Secretary of the Army. If confirmed, my personal background will also inform my views as I oversee the vast responsibilities associated with the Corps. I grew up in New Mexico, a state rich in natural resources, with the exception of water, I am proud of my Native American heritage and the fact that my grandfather was a leader within Taos Pueblo working to protect the tribe's water rights and its cultural resources. My childhood home in Las Cruces, New Mexico is located across the street from a major irrigation canal that was constructed with federal assistance and, I, and it serves a large agricultural area. I grew up wit witnessing the important role the federal government plays in supporting and protecting the economic foundation of many communities while also providing access to the recreational resources that enhance the quality of a life for our citizens. If confirmed, I will be focused and committed to the work necessary to fulfill my responsibilities and meet the challenges facing the Corps and its stakeholders, your constituents. Of course, the Corps cannot be successful on its own in my years in public service have reinforced the importance of collaboration. I commit to this task with a sense of humility and a keen understanding of the need to work with state and local leaders, the public, affected stakeholders and members of Congress to most effectively carry out the Corps' mission. I am equally committed to increasing coordination within the federal government, a whole of government approach that is more effective and efficient in addressing the effects of a changing lands landscape across the country. Finally, with your support, I will be proud to join a department led by Secretary Austin, Deputy Secretary Hicks, and Secretary Warmoth, who have made clear their intent to lead with transparency, transparency integrity, and the highest ethical standards in carrying out the Defense Department's and the Army's vital missions. I am equally committed to these principles. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee, and I look forward to your questions. Again, welcome. I, I uh, want to begin uh, the, uh, the questioning of, uh, of our witness today uh, by, by noting that Senator Capito and I have agreed to move to five-minute uh, rounds of questions uh, with additional rounds of discretion of the chair when her, with her concurrence. To begin, uh, this committee has three, um, uh, Ms. Gunner, the committee, as you may know, has three uh, standing uh, yes or no questions that we ask of all uh, nominees who appear before us. And so I want to ask uh, those questions of you now. And uh, if, you, uh, if you screw these up, then we'll just call, <laughs> call it an early morning. <laughs> so, but I don't, I don't think you will. I don't think you will. Uh, do you, first question, do you agree? if confirmed to appear before this committee or designated members of this committee and other appropriate committees of the Congress and provide information subject to appropriate and necessary security protections with respect to your responsibilities. Do you agree? Yes. So far, so good. Second question. Do you agree to ensure that testimony, briefings, documents, and electronic and other forms of communication of information are provided to this committee and its staff and other appropriate committees in a timely manner. Do you agree? Yes, I do. Thank you. Do you know of any matters which uh, you may or may not have disclosed that might place you in a conflict of interest if you are confirmed? Do you? No. Good. Okay, my first question would be, uh, uh, 
dealing um, a little bit with your experience with the Department of Interior. Your experience uh, with the Department of Interior, including the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, was largely focused on issues that affect the Western U.S., including energy, conservation, and climate change. My question is this. Please tell us about your experience with coastal programs and what would be your approach in prioritizing water infrastructure projects to address coastal needs as well as the rural and inland needs of our country? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I certainly have experience dealing with coastal issues as it related to reclamations uh, programs and water resources issues. Uh, that is probably one of the biggest differences, though, between Reclamation's mission and the Corps of Engineers' mission, mission is the amount of coastal work. So most of my experience uh, in the coastal arena has to do with work I did as Deputy Secretary related to our facilities, uh, national parks, uh, other initiatives related to coastal uh, issues, dealing with erosion, um, uh, coastal surge issues. Uh, and my work as a member of the Restore Council in the aftermath of Deepwater Horizon and looking at the number of projects and the funding that was available uh, to do just that, restore areas of the coast, which was uh, you know, protecting our coastal facilities, building up wetlands, uh, addressing coastal surge issues, making the investments necessary to fortify our coast in the face of the issues uh, associated with climate change, long-term resilience, as well as the restoration efforts out in the Gulf of Mexico that were necessary. So I feel I have a general and a fairly good understanding and some good history uh, in dealing with those uh, coastal issues, uh, recognizing that the Corps' mission uh, in particular is, is founded in great part uh, on uh, those ports uh, and those waterways, and now coastal protection. Uh, issues uh, in the face of a changing climate and the resiliency needed uh, as we protect beaches, as we look at uh, erosion issues, as we try and uh, once again deal with and adapt, and adapt to the changes that are occurring in our environment. Well, I'm told that you're a quick study and uh, we, uh, we are counting on that to be the case, especially as you come up to speed on, on the issue, coastal issues, which a number of us are looking to my left. And even over here, my far left, there were the Great Lakes. Uh, there's a lot of interest in uh, on both both sides there on these issues. Thank you. Um, my second question was uh, recently. There's been a lot of discussion regarding the method used to calculate the benefit to cost ratio. We talked a little bit about this when uh, when we were on uh, either together on the phone. But um, uh, a lot of discussion regarding uh, the method used to calculate the benefit to cost ratio and the emission of benefits that are hard to quantify. For example, the benefit to cost ratio does not account for savings associated with not having to provide emergency response when a proposed uh, project functions as intended. The benefit to cost ratio also fails to really capture long-term environmental benefits and tertiary economic benefits. Here's my question. Uh, what other factors should be considered in identifying project benefits in order for initiatives to move forward and how should the Corps better prioritize, prioritize projects to reflect all of the benefits? Thank you, Senator. Um, that's a question that uh, folks have been wrestling with for quite a while now, how to assess the full range of benefits associated with any projects. We understand the costs uh, with most projects, not that we always uh, estimate them accurately uh, up front. Uh, but with respect to evaluating benefits, uh, I think it's important to keep in front of us the economic returns that we expect, but there are uh, particularly in multifaceted projects and all of our projects should be looking at multiple purposes these days. There are ecosystems benefits, there are communities of need and the protection of those uh, communities uh, that in evaluating, ev valuing the land associate with uh, the protections that are gonna be in place with this specific uh, project, it's not equitable. Uh, to consider just the pure value ascribed uh, through some appraisal process that doesn't recognize the need. Uh, so I think all of these factors need to be assessed. We need to better understand. And really, you know, there is huge economic value to ecosystem services that I don't think we can have properly valued to date. And then there is the uh, local regional benefits associated with communities of a need that need to be integrated into that benefit cost formula. I see, uh, based on 
the direction where this administration is going, based on the direction Congress has clearly gone in the last Water Resources Development Act, uh, that there is direction for the Corps to better account for the value of those benefits. Uh, I am fully supportive of those efforts and working on that if I'm confirmed. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, Senator Caput. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Connor. And thank you for uh, your willingness to serve. Certainly appreciate that. Uh, my first question was going to be very similar to what the chairman asked in that your, pr your prior uh, um, experience has been at the, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation, wondering uh, there's certain areas, obviously, of the core navigation and flight risk management that are areas of uh, core responsibility that you didn't really actually deal with over at uh, reclamation. I didn't know if you needed, if you wanted to address that issue more deeply. Uh, how you're going to, you know, get up to speed on that? I mean, obviously, you've already done a lot of research in that area. Sure, Senator. Thank you. Um, a lot of there was an overlap. Certainly, the Bureau of Reclamation's mission with respect to water supply, in particular, is fairly unique. Although the Corps does have water supply responsibilities, and I talked to Senator Kramer about that. Um, but also, there is lots of overlap, and I do think where that experience will pay off, particularly in flood risk management. Uh, part of the fundamental mission of the Bureau of Reclamation was also flood control. Uh, worked very closely in the Central Valley of California with respect to Folsom Dam on a coordinated flood management program, uh, fortification of that dam and, and its spillway uh, with the Corps, jointly managing a construction project. Uh, so and the river restoration, the aquatic uh, ecosystem restoration uh, re program that the Corps has. Uh, in partnership, we work, did work with the Corps at the Bureau of Reclamation and on its own, Reclamation also had si similar uh, significant river restoration uh, opportunities. So I think there is a lot of parallels, experience mm -hmm. that will directly apply. As I mentioned, there are areas where I need to get up to speed. I'll just mention one of the hydropower, obviously, was very, very similar. Uh, in the approach that we had to take to manage that resource, deal with changes, effects of a fluctuating water supply these days, and that will be similar with the core. Right, that's gonna be critical. Now, on the flood risk management, uh, we had a terrible flood in 2016. I might have mentioned this on the phone with you that uh, took 23 lives and destroyed more than 1,000 homes in, in West Virginia. Uh, and the core has been very active to try to help us prevent such things as happen. Uh, I did put initial funding into the Canal River Basin feasibility study to determine what additional projects might be needed to improve this flood risk management. So I'm going to ask you today, will you continue to work with me on that to initiate this study? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, we did talk on the phone about the length of time it takes for certain permitting. Uh, by the time you get all the different agencies and um, different um, um, in coordination between state and local, I guess, and, and federal. Uh, I guess my question is not so much the length of time, but in your experience, do you think that fed, that states can, uh, are capable of pr protecting environmental resources such as water resources within their own borders? How do you see that interplay of cooperative federalism playing out? I, I think the most the easiest answer is yes, states are fully capable mm -hmm. of protecting their water resources. At the same time, we obviously have a system where there are state laws that apply, there are state responsibilities under federal law, and there are federal responsibilities. Uh, so we have to improve that cooperative federalism. It is absolutely critical. I am a very strong proponent of making our permitting processes as efficient as possible. Given the challenges that we face, we need to make decisions. Uh, we need to work collaboratively with state and local communities. Uh, and we need to sync up particularly amongst federal agencies. I was a member of the FAST 41 uh, task force that worked on permitting efficiencies. We need to keep the thoroughness of the reviews, but there is lost time in the lack of coordination. We need to improve uh, upon that at the federal level and then take that to the next step, uh, work in partnership with the states. I certainly agree with that. I mean, when you look at the different agencies that, that weigh in on whatever project that might be, Fish and Wildlife, EPA, the core, by the time you go through the permitting process of all that, you're into, into years. Uh, and, and years not only don't solve the problem, but they also cost a lot of money at the same time. And a lot of people walk away from projects at certain periods of time because they just obviously can't afford to stay in the process. So however we can help you with that, we'd certainly like to see the thoroughness there, but also the timeliness uh, at the same time. My last question for right now is on the WOTUS rule. I mentioned it in my opening statement. Uh, I know you're not at the core yet, but um, the rationale for taking the WOTUS regulations, we obviously saw it in court 
all over the country with sort of mixed results in terms of who's 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 acting under it, who isn't. A lot of confusion for a lot of different uh, range of whether it's personal golf courses, agriculture, whatever it might be. So, what challenges do you think the core will face? Uh, including related to uh, obtaining permits for core projects if, if a new WOTUS definition is finalized that is more expansive than the 2015 rule? Well, the rule, Senator, um, the rule has changed so many times over the years that I'm not sure the challenges are going to be any different. We need to have a clear uh, definition of waters of the U.S., one that is protective as it should be under the Clean Water Act, but one that provides uh, uh, clarity and I think you know, the goal from what I understand in embarking upon a new rule is to work very closely uh, with the uh, affected parties uh, under that rule. And so my goal would be to be, have a clear rule that has some enough level of input that hopefully we can get out of this litigation cycle and that we can move on with a rule uh, that's going to be in place for a number of years. That should be the goal. That will do the most, I think, to help the core in its permitting ability and its responsibilities for making jurisdictional determinations if we have some clarity and we have some longevity to the next rule. And that's going to require some collaboration, working with stakeholders, and I believe that's the game plan. Thank you. Well, we'll be, we'll be watching that and uh, appreciate your input on that. Thank you. Yes. Okay, thanks, thanks, Senator Capito. Now I want to turn to uh, Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Welcome, uh, Mr. Connor. Thank Good you. to have you with us, and I appreciate very much the uh, dedication and the skill that you've shown in your service. Um, and you and I don't have any problems, um, but I have a big problem with the organization that you're going to come into. Um, <clears throat> and I apologize for loading this onto you. But did you ever see the movie Groundhog Day? <laughs> yes, sir. So every morning, Bill Murray <laughs> wakes up, and it's the same damn morning over and over and over again. So I've been on the Army Corps on this issue for years, back through the Obama administration, through the Trump administration. And we get some happy talk from people when they're at the table here. And then after that, complete blow off, complete disinterest. And the two issues that concern me, one is quite a simple one, and that is getting answers and getting congressional mandates paid attention to. The Army Corps seems to believe that when we pass a law that instructs the Army Corps to do something, that is an optional, faint suggestion, maybe to be listened to if it's convenient and consistent with other internal bureaucratic goals of the Army Corps. I think that's got to stop, and Mr. Chairman. I think we've got to work out some kind of an operating protocol between this committee and the Army Corps so that the things that we instruct as elected representatives the Army Corps to do actually get done. So that's point A. Point B, as a coastal state senator, all right, our chairman, I'll just go down my side. Our chairman is a coastal state senator. Senator Cardin is a coastal state senator. I'm a coastal state senator. Senator Merkley's a coastal state senator. Senator Markey's a coastal state senator. Senator Padilla's a coastal state senator. And if you throw in the Great Lakes, you pick up Senator Stabenow and you pick up Senator Duckworth. So I have been hollering at the Army Corps for years about your flood and coastal damage reduction fund. Flood and coastal damage reduction fund. Do you know how much of the flood and coastal damage reduction fund actually goes to coastal? A very small amount, from my understanding. Very small amount. Um, in a bad year, it's $120 for inland for every $1 for coastal. So less than 1% in a bad year. We're operating right now under a proposal where it would be 45 to 1. So, you know, help me with the math here. 45 to 1 on a percentage basis, I think that translates to about 97 plus percent to inland and 2 percent and some change to coastal. In your answer to Senator Carper, you talked about your awareness of all these coastal issues that we're facing. 
We're looking at nine feet of sea level rise in Rhode Island by the end of the century. We're looking at having to redraw the maps of my state because of sea level rise. We're looking at dramatic changes in the fisheries, dramatic changes in storm risk. Our coasts are in dire distress. And the Army Corps blunders on just completely obtuse to that risk. Year after year after year, treating coastal, it's not even a stepchild. It's like you can root in the garbage and see if you can find something, but we're going to feed everything. All of our interest goes to inland. And I got to tell you, Mr. Connor, I'm, this is too many Groundhog Days, and I'm sorry that this is you at this moment, but I need some resolution of this with your organization. I cannot go forward with this enormous fund that is so important to coastal health, the Flood and Coastal Damage Reduction Fund, getting 1% or 2% of its funding for all of America's coasts, our Pacific coasts, our Gulf coasts, our Mid-Atlantic coasts, all of Florida, our Northeastern coasts, all of them share 1% to 2% of this fund, while inland soaks up 97%, 98%. Is that not indefensible in this day and age, knowing the risks that our coasts face? Well, Senator, I hear your concern. I've read your letter. Um, it sounds like, you know, the step one is the answers as to why. Why is the funding allocated in the way it is? And I actually don't care very much about why. I want finito. I want it stopped. And I want this, I want some balance. If why helps us get to balance, then I'd be interested in why. But I don't want a lot of why that gives us year after year after year after year of coasts getting essentially frozen out of the coastal damage reduction fund. I think that's a reasonable request. I'm sorry that this is my like umpteenth groundhog day and that you happen to be here on this particular groundhog morning. But I'm done with putting up with this, and I'm done with the non-responsiveness of the Army Corps to this flagrant misallocation of resources. Senator, I will understand the why so that I can get to you to the how, um, which is how we make those changes that you're requesting. Uh, and I'm fully committed to the idea of resiliency cuts across every program of the Corps of Engineers, and we've got to address it on all levels and all threats as you've mentioned. Thank you, and I know the chairman shares my concern because his state actually has shallower coasts than mine, and the same sea level rise that's gonna raise nine feet on my shores and do immense damage to my state is gonna be even worse for Delaware, which not only is Chairman Carper's state, but there's also somebody you report to who comes from that state. And it's not so Chris Jones. done. <laughs> Could be someday. Uh, Senator uh, White House, Delaware is the lowest lying state in America. The highest point of land in Delaware is a bridge. And so we have uh, grave concerns about these issues. And maybe the, uh, the, maybe the best th thing we can do is once you've had a chance to settle in, I've confirmed, settle in your new job, just to have an oversight hearing and, and come back and, and drill down on this a bit more. And along with some other subjects too. Thank, thank, One with thank answers you. would be great. Thanks. There you go. There you go. <laughs> um, and now, uh, Senator Inhofe, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, well, first of all, I uh, let me talk a little bit to Sherry and Gabby. Don't worry about things today. This guy received a 100% vote in confirmation in the past. Not many people can say that. All right. And uh, it's one that we've worked with uh, very close together. There are two, three issues. Actually, two of them are going to be asking for commitments, which I think should come, but I just want to make sure that's on record. But the first one has to do with the WOTUS rule. Uh, uh, Senator Capito had some concerns. I share those concerns. I was very disappointed, but not surprised that the EPA and the Army Corps have decided to repeal the and replace the Trump-era navigation waters protection rule. But 
you know, that isn't, this isn't the, that's not the end of it. Uh, we know what happens when we change administrations. We know that uh, the likelihood is going to happen again. The Obama era WOTUS rule, which was the number, was the number one regulatory concern of my farm. We're a farm state in Oklahoma. Uh, and the, their number one concern, uh, essentially what that the WOTUS rule did was take away from the states uh, the, and give to the federal government that, that jurisdiction. Uh, my people in Oklahoma, my farmers in Oklahoma didn't think that was a good idea. And, uh, and so that's still something that will be taking place. We're not sure how it's going to end up. And if so, it won't be a lasting end, in my opinion. Now, in June, the EPA released a statement saying the EPA and the Army Corps determined the Trump era rule is leading to significant environmental degradation. Significant environmental de degradation. Now, I know you're not currently at the core. Are, are you aware of any specific and significant degradation, environmental degradation, that would be tied to the Trump rule? Senator, I'm not aware of any specific circumstances right now. Yeah, and, and I'm not either. And if you feel one coming on, will you let me know? Um, then secondly, we have, we have a, a levy system in, in my, my home uh, city of Tulsa. It's, it's built in the 1940s. Uh, it's been, it's survived. We had a real close call two years ago. And I think you probably are familiar with that. It did get attention all over the nation. Mm -hmm. And we are concerned about that. It was, uh, the word at 2020 authorized this project and this was uh, this was built in the, in the in the 1940s it's got to be modernized to fully protect the 2.2 billion dollars in homes and businesses along the Arkansas River including two refineries and uh, I showed you and your your staffs of these refineries uh, this was authorized the, the, the 2000 the word of bill in 2020 we're all familiar with that it had joint jurisdiction between two committees. It uh, authorized this project, and I submitted the, a congressional direct spending request to expedite design work so this project remains on the fast track. My first ask of you is will you commit to ensuring this project remains a priority for the Corps? Yes, Senator. You have my commitment. My understanding is that uh, got a significant amount of resources in the FY 2022, 2022 budget. Yeah. Uh, and so I would like to continue the efforts of working with you. Good. And, and I appreciate that. And I anticipated that would be the case. Uh, the, the last thing I want to mention is the MCARNs. It's the, uh, uh, recently, the Assistant Secretary of the Army uh, Civil Works uh, recently made the decision that the MCARN's 12-foot deepening project does not require new investment decision for the purpose of dedicating funds for construction. Now, that was a, main, a, a major thing. It was a very meaningful thing to Senator Bozeman, to uh, myself, and uh, to a num number of others. But deepening the MCARN's to the 12-foot, giving in mind that the entire channel would be nine foot, but now changing it to, to in a very small amount, we'll change it to a 12 foot channel that'll increase the load, the capacity by some 40%. It's a huge thing there. And, uh, it, and um, uh, deepening that uh, is now pretty much accepted to uh, everyone. And I just want to make sure that you don't have any plans or any knowledge of anything that would come along and change that at this time. So I'd ask if you'd commit to following this decision. This is the decision that it does not require a new, uh, a new investment decision for the purpose of dedicating funds for construction. Uh, so will you commit to following that, this decision? I am committed to following the decision. I'm not aware of anything that would uh, change that All right, uh, approach. That's, that's fine. I look forward to working with you. Thank you, Senator. You bet. Uh, Senator Stapano is next. She'll be uh, followed uh, by Senator Creamer and Senator Bozeman. Senator Stapano. Well, thank you, Mr. Roger. Chairman. I, I want to follow up uh, supporting comments of uh, Senator Whitehouse's, but I do want to uh, make one correction. Actually, the Great Lakes have more shoreline than the East Coast and West Coast 
combined. We have 4,530 miles, 3,458 miles on the east and west coast. So we refer to ourselves as the ocean without the salt. And we um, and, and what you do uh, is incredibly, uh, incredibly important and impactful. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers is, uh, particularly right now, uh, University of Michigan has uh, put out a study saying that the Great Lakes are warming faster than the coast. And I understand the incredible urgency on the coast, but we, we are feeling it. I could go on and on about what, it, what is happening right now. Um, but I want to talk specifically on, about two important Army Corps projects that we really uh, need to have even more of a sense of urgency on. One relates to our uh, one of our biggest threats on invasive species, which is Asian carp, a great big fish. I never thought I'd, fish would keep me up at night. This big fish that has no functioning stomach gets to 100 pounds and just in the water kind of destroys everything else. Uh, when it gets into the Great Lakes. It's very close to the Great Lakes. We have been operating for a number of years, working with Illinois and the Army Corps to stop these fish coming up the Mississippi River through a project that's been identified and is in the works, but needs to move faster, called the Brandon Road Lock and Dam. Senator Portman and I have led a bipartisan effort now for years to identify and create the technology that would be able to stop the fish, but allow the barges to continue to move up the rivers into Chicago. So I appreciate the, the expertise of the Army Corps, but we have to have uh, an incredible sense of urgency about the fish aren't waiting for us. They don't wait for an appropriation cycle. And the economic damage, as you were talking about, sort of how we put all this together and, and so on, the economic damage of um, these fish destroying um, billions of dollars, seven billion dollar fishing industry in the Great Lakes and 16 billion dollar boating industry um, is very serious. So that's one. The other that is in process, but also I'm concerned about how fast it's moving, is something called the Sioux Locks, which allows uh, major ships to come down the St. Lawrence Seaway from the oceans into the Great Lakes. And we uh, built in World War II. They actually did it pretty fast in World War II. We were able to start to finish, do it in a couple of years. We're now looking at, uh, it's been 20 years just to get to a point we're now funding the engineering of it in another 10. But we have one lock that holds, that will allow the big barges to get in the Great Lakes. This is all of our raw materials for manufacturing, for agriculture. Um, it, if something happens to that lock, you shut down a major part of the economy actually for the country. And so um, as the head of the Corps, uh, can I count on you to work with us and to support in every way we can expediting these two projects that are critical for the economy of the Great Lakes? Senator Stabenow, you absolutely have my uh, commitment on that front with respect to the Asian carp. I've seen that and been watching the situation unfold for many, many years now. This, to me, not only the urgency of the situation, the work the Corps needs to do, but the whole of government approach I know USGS has done a lot of the scientific work in support of this effort. It's, it's an area where we need to bring folks together. And with respect to the, the lock system, we've seen just in Suez uh, most recently what a few yeah. days means to international commerce. So uh, we need to take care of this infrastructure. Thank you. And you're exactly right. What happened in the Suez Canal could happen um, in our country through the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Sioux Locks. Um, you know, we, we're holding our breath uh, at this point in time. It doesn't happen. Let me just ask uh, one other uh, question in conclusion. Um, uh, resiliency. The Great Lakes uh, Basin, as, the, as our um, other coasts, very concerned. We're, we're seeing uh, high water levels and literally, um, you know, uh, shoreline falling in the water, houses falling in the water because of erosion. Um, damage to agriculture, all, all kinds of serious issues. But we have for a number of years now, again, a bipartisan initiative to have the Army Corps do a Great Lakes resiliency study. We've had it in the budget. We passed it, the authorization for it a number of years ago. Uh, never been funded. It is now in President Biden's budget. It is critical that this move as quickly as possible to assist our 
Great Lakes coast in being able to deal with what we need to do on infrastructure resiliency. And so um, I would ask uh, for your support and um, any comments on that. Yes, absolutely my support, uh, obviously because it's in the president's budget, but because given the urgency of the situation, I have, uh, there's obviously the impacts of climate on water uh, out west, which I'm very familiar with, but I've become more familiar with later. I'm not sure there's any bodies of water more impacted than the Great Lakes with the fluctuations that are happening now uh, and the storm surges at high levels. So that resilience study, I view that uh, consistent with your views. Incredibly important to move forward expeditiously. Thank you. I look forward to working with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Chairman, thanks for joining us. I think Senator Kramer is next, then followed by Senator Carton and then Senator Bozen. Senator Thank Kramer. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Connor. Um, good to see you yesterday in the Armed Services Committee. Today, I, you don't have all those other military guys <laughs> around you. You're on your own, but you're doing just fine. And uh, Sherry and Gabriella, uh, welcome and uh, congratulations. I enjoyed very much our conversation on the yes, board. I, it was hard not to nerd out a little bit on a couple of <laughs> these things. <laughs> Sometimes I think there are only a couple of us that know what we're talking about. And then I find out, no, there's just one and it's not me. Um, but... <laughs> But it was, but I enjoyed it. I, I want to start by um, asking a fundamental policy question and really sort of drilling down on some of the things that you visited with uh, Senator uh, uh, Capital um, or Senator uh, Moore Capital on. Um, and that is, of course, states' rights. You and I talked about it. Um, and it's, it's an area, I think, for a lot of us that, you know, we, we in many cases, particularly out in the middle of the country, maybe uh, feel a little bit, um, you know, isolated from. Uh, from things and sometimes, you know, not just forgotten, but maybe getting too much attention from, from time to time. And uh, I know it, it's an issue that you dealt with, you grappled with, obviously, when you were, uh, you know, the commissioner for reclamation, that was, it, it was important. And, and, and there are two, two of the most fundamental statutes that govern the core, the Flood Control Act of 1944, and then, of course, the Water Supply Act of 1958, which expressly reinforced states' rights and, and, uh, and reinforce the historic policy of deferring to state water rights. The Flood Control Act's declaration of policy specifically states, I'm going to quote here, it is hereby declared to be the policy of the Congress to recognize the interests and rights of the states in determining the development of the watersheds within their borders and likewise their interests and rights in water utilization and control, unquote. Similarly, the Water Supply Act reinforces, quote, it is declared to be the policy of the Congress to recognize the primary responsibilities of the states and local interests in developing water supplies for domestic, municipal, industrial, and other purposes, unquote. So at the end of the Obama administration, uh, you and I talked about this, the Corps proposed what became known as the Water Supply Rule, which both Republican and Democratic Western states adamantly opposed. I mean, and adamantly, I mean adamantly, I mean unanimously opposed. And it's not very often that, that Oregon and North Dakota are on the exact same page or where the attorneys general of those two states and the governors of those two states will, will sign on paper their opposition to something. And so when it comes, though, to, to uh, messing, up, messing with states' water rights, uh, we in the West get pretty, pretty serious and pretty united. So thankfully, the rule was formally withdrawn under the Trump administration after this bipartisan blowback. And, uh, and I, with that in mind, I want to ask, do you believe that the Corps was right to withdraw the rule? And if so, can you commit that it will not be proposed again, at least under your leadership? Well, Senator, thank you. And I, I greatly enjoyed our con conversation. And at the risk of being even wonkier, I'll say the acts you just referenced are the same as Section 8 of the Reclamation Act. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm used to working under that regime. I am not familiar with the, the specifics of the regulation that was proposed. I am very sensitive, though, to the concerns that you just raised. And given the opposition, um, there can't be progress moving forward with something that's been rejected previously. Uh, and so you have my commitment to uh, look into that issue, make sure that uh, we work on something productive together. I think coming up with something, as I understand, in our conversation, uh, that is close to getting support necessary so that water al water resources can be allocated from those core facilities is incredibly important. Uh, we see it in the west-wide drought. It's no longer a regional drought. It's a west-wide drought. And we need to, uh, getting back to my overall objective, is to ensuring that these facilities have the maximum multiple uh, beneficial purposes. I'm happy to work with you on your approach. 
I thank you, and, and I appreciated your, um, you know, you, you're elaborating a little bit on collective or on uh, cooperative federalism with with uh, Senator Moore Capito. It was made, sound, it was refreshing to hear. So I won't dig into that. But I'm going to go quickly to the Dakota Access Pipeline, which, as you know, originates in North Dakota, runs 358 miles through North D Dakota. Um, 0.21 miles of the 358 miles are, are, are being contested, as, as you know, you, of course, were the Deputy Secretary at the time of the protests and that, that, that was built. Um, I, I won't relitigate the whole thing. You know it very well. A lot of people know it very well. But at the, the issue at hand now, of course, while the, while the, the pipeline continues to function safely, move about a little over half a million barrels of oil per day. 60% of the oil from the Mandan Hadassah Rikara Nation flows uh, on that pipeline. Um, as you know, a judge here in D.C. ordered the previous the, the EA to be replaced with an EIS, and that's of course what's where the challenges come for whether to shut the pipeline down while the EIS is done. It's not going to be shut down, as you know. Um, it's, it's legally sustainable now. My question, though, is if, if you're confirmed with this EIS continuing, and it's expected to be done in March of next year, um, and that will determine a couple of things. One, whether you know the, the pipeline was cited properly, mostly cited by the state of North Dakota, other than this 0 0.21 2 .1 miles under the Missouri River. But um, do, you have, do I have your commitment that you'll do everything you can to keep politics out of the EIS process because I, you know, I mean, I firmly believe the EIS will confirm the EA, uh, which was done by the Obama administration. So Senator Kramer, yes, we need to move forward uh, consistent with the law and the very clear direction uh, that the court has given to move forward with an EIS to do a thorough analysis addressing the deficiencies that the court found. Uh, those are legal questions and they're technical questions that need to be followed up that the, the district office is moving forward on a very firm schedule for completing that, I think, in the spring of next year. Uh, I want to oversee that and understand it, given the visibility of the issue and the importance of tribal consultation in moving forward. Uh, and so uh, that's going to be the process. It's not going to be a political one. Yeah, th thank you. And by the way, I, you might have noticed just this, this week or late last week, the first consultation with the, a tribe took place um, with, for the EIS. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator. Senator Cardin, thanks for rejoining us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Connor, I, I enjoyed our conversation. Um, thank you for your willingness to take on this important responsibility, and thank you to your family for sharing in the public service. I, I want to start with one I think is the core, one of the core functions of the core, and that is to keep our shipping channels safe and navigable. When I first started in politics, the location of dredge material was an extremely political, difficult subject. Careers were won and lost by location of dredge materials. That's no longer the case, at least for the shipping channel into the Baltimore Harbor. Uh, we've been able to find locations that have used the dredge material for beneficial use. Um, we've gone over Poplar Island, which was a restored island, environmentally uh, uh, environmental success. The communities that are closest to it uh, cheered the re restoration of this island. The wildlife there is now fantastic. We have our second location in Mid Bay uh, that is a priority for the Maryland congressional delegation, uh, and we will be seeking construction money in this uh, uh, this budget cycle with the support of the Army Corps. I mention that because you and I had a, a positive dis conversation. And I just really want uh, to get your input as to helping us move forward with projects such as Mid-Bay that will allow us to have a site for the dredge materials to keep our channels open and safe, but also restore the, the environmental community, uh, which helps us with the Chesapeake Bay and our environment. Senator Cardin, thank you. I very much enjoyed our conversation, particularly about this uh, set of projects uh, with the beneficial use of dredge material. I would just, I'm going to express a huge enthusiasm for the approach that you've taken with Poplar Island and the other projects that are planned. I, I want to pause and say, given my enthusiasm, I'm quite aware of the backlog in the Corps' budget for authorized projects and the need for funding. Uh, and I'm certainly hopeful that through the jobs package and the other work going on that uh, there'll be additional resources because getting to the point 
uh, that project is fantastic. That concept is fantastic. The idea that we're going to enhance uh, long-term commerce through the effective dredging program uh, through the Port of Baltimore uh, and other ports, and then use that material to build resiliency and to restore and address problems with, you know, uh, the vigorous action, uh, the surges of the erosion taking place because of climate change is just a win-win-win all around. Um, and we need to do more of that. Uh, so you've got my strong commitment that we will look forward to those opportunities and developing those win-win-wins. Well, thank you. That's exactly what the leadership will need. Uh, we talked also about Blackwater, where we use dredge materials to restore wetlands, which was worked much more effectively than I think our engineers originally thought or expected uh, with uh, success in a relatively short period of time. <clears throat> There's a cost issue. But when you weigh the environmental benefits, it really is the right investment and deals with resiliency and, and uh, protection against uh, erosion. Let me go on to an issue that the chairman mentioned in his original questioning, and that is the economic analysis on doing projects. Uh, commercial activity tied to small channels do not necessarily rise to the same level of funding priority among the Army Corps because of the way the analysis is done. But these small channels, and we have huge backlogs in dealing with this, are incredibly important to local communities in dealing with their way of life and dealing with the safety of, of, of their activities, recreational issues, et cetera, that again, don't rise to the same level uh, on your analysis. We know there's a funding issue and we're gonna do everything we can to give you the resources you need to make significant progress on the backlog. I would just like to get uh, your uh, help in working with the local communities so that they have a realistic expectation as to when their projects can be funded and how we can best line them up for participation with the Army Corps. Yes, Senator, you have my commitment on that front. I think. Um you know, we have focused on national benefits for quite a long time, whether it's the Bureau of Reclamation, whether it's the Corps of Engineers, and we've seen inequities as a result of that focus. And so now is the time, and I think, once again, this is an area that Congress has given pretty good direction in the last uh, Water Resources Development Act through authorization of pilot projects for economically disadvantaged communities, through direction on, on relooking at the benefit cost uh, determinations and taking into local and regional benefits uh, a lot more. So uh, you have my commitment. Uh, that's one of the challenges now is to expand the protections and the work that the Corps does for the benefit of those economically disadvantaged communities that have been left behind. Yeah, I would just point out, Mr. Chairman, in closing, and, and that is the livelihoods, the, uh, the tourism, the recreational use in small communities are very much impacted by the work done by the Army Corps. So I just think, as we always look at the major projects, and I'm strongly in support of those, we also need, we shouldn't ignore the underserved smaller communities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Cardin. Uh, Senator Bozeman. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And thank you for being with us, Mr. Connor. And we do appreciate your willingness to serve in a, such an important position. Uh, I want to talk to you about a couple of projects that are really important to Arkansas. And, uh, in an effort to use our, our water resources as best we can. And we're blessed with good good water resources mm -hmm. uh, for the most part. But we've got two projects going on, the Grand uh, Prairie Irrigation Project and also the Biomeda Project. And what, they're, what they do is they take surface water and, and use the surface water versus using our aquifers. Uh, we've got two huge aquifers, the Alluvial and the Sparta, and they cover that entire region of the country, spreading up into Tennessee. Uh, they're the water supply for Memphis, you know, areas like that, besides, you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, acres for agriculture. And, and what they do is divert water uh, from the uh, White River and the Arkansas River that have an excess of surface water, divert that and use that as the irrigation water versus taking from the, uh, from the aquifers. Uh, we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on these projects. The Corps has been very supportive through the years. But, but in the last, you know, several years, things have languished. We're very close to completion. 
And really what I'd like for you to, is, is really simple, just get a commitment for you to come out in the not too distant future, look at the projects, uh, give us some advice as to how we can move things forward, visit with us, visit with the stakeholders. Uh, the core likes the projects. Again, it's just a matter of us kind of rolling up our sleeves and figuring out uh, exactly how we can, uh, you know, just put the last touches on so that we can go forward and get them completed. Senator, I'd be happy to come out uh, this, you know, conjunctive use of surface groundwater and, and trying to find the right match to provide firm supplies, but also, you know, protect the environment uh, uh, surrounding the area is incredibly interesting to me. I'm happy. It sounds like a project that's well on its way. I'd be happy to. Uh, Great projects. There. And again, protecting water, less energy use, you know, the whole bit. So, uh, and then again, our, our, our groundwater is so, so very important. It's yes. trying to get those things recharged. I want to second what uh, Senator Inhofe said regarding the Arkansas River and the 9 to 12 foot channel. Uh, Arkansas and Oklahoma are joined at the hip in those projects. And uh, uh, for all of the reasons that you said, you know, when you can increase uh, a barge by 40 percent, what does that do as far as saving energy, you know, efficiencies, things like that? So it's really important, lowering cost. Uh, the other thing I'd like to talk to you about, and I know you're, you're getting bombarded with this, but it's so important. I'm ranking on agriculture. And, uh, you know, WOTUS has been a huge burden to my state in the past uh, with the agriculture community for years. Uh, it created so much uncertainty, it was difficult for farmers to plan. Farm Bureau, a grassroots organization, went through a Herculean effort to ensure farmers and ranchers' voices were heard during the, the Obama administration. If confirmed, will you work with our cities, agriculture, state governments, and stakeholders to create a rule that, that won't get held up for years in the courts and, and create not creating this uncertainty that we've seen in the past with our farm community and so many other areas. Senator, if confirmed, uh, you have my commitment to doing that. Durability and longevity of a new rule um, will be a very high priority. Very much. And a huge challenge. Yes, we do. But I uh, hope we can work together, you know, to, to thread that needle, which is so, so very important for so many different reasons. Uh, again, I, I just want to... Uh, I agree with uh, Senator Whitehouse and his concern for the for the uh, all the outer banks, but also uh, you know there is a lot of resources going into the into the inland waterways. When you count up all the streams and lakes and rivers and all that, it's you know a humongous amount of shoreline. So we've got all kinds of uh, problems regarding erosion there. What you get into. The way I see it is there's lots of don't do this, don't do that with our streams. There's lots of management from the state and the, and the federal government. That's not a bad thing, okay, in the sense of, you know, if it's done in the right way. The problem is there's no one that is really managing the, uh, uh, you know, taking care of them in the sense of, you know, providing the resources that we need to, to prevent the erosion, things like that. So that's something else that we'd like to like to work with you on. Yes, absolutely. Very good. Those are important issues. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Bozeman. Great to see you. And uh, we have uh, joining us by uh, WebEx is Senator Duckworth, and we've also been joined in person by Senator Padilla. Welcome. And bienvenido. And uh, glad you could be uh, be here. And um, if uh, no one else shows up, uh, either in person or remotely, you'll be the last. Uh, 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 Thank you. Unless uh, Senator... When I come up with some questions, we might do that. All right. Uh, Senator Duckworth, are you there? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding today's hearing. Thank you, uh, Mr. Connor, for your participation today. In an increasingly competitive global marketplace, our inland waterways are absolutely critical to the economic well-being of Illinois farmers as well as other Midwest industries. Waterways are so important to our competitiveness that a handful of years ago, industry stakeholders banded together to secure from Congress a tax increase can you imagine they asked for a tax increase on their own operations in support of investments to keep our locks and dams in good repair that's something you just don't see every day 
Um, the Corps of Engineers recently updated its capital investment strategy that prioritizes lock construction projects with industry stakeholders based on their importance and benefit to the nation. And in fact, in the, its 2020 report, the Corps and the Inland Waterways User Board ranked Lock and Dam 25 and LaGrange Lock and Dam on the Mississippi River as part of the Navigation and Ecosystem Sustainability Program, known as NEST, as a tier alpha project, meaning they are among the Corps' top priorities um, uh, for construction. Mr. Connor, these projects are critical and must get underway as soon as possible. Will you commit to working with me to ensure that these projects receiving a new start? Yes, Senator, you have my commitment to understanding the importance and the, the work that's been done recently on inways, inland waterways, the trust fund, and the plans under that. Uh, I am happy to make the commitment to continue to work with you in that effort. Thank you. Um, uh, as to urban flooding, you know, Word of 2018 directed the Corps to furnish a report to Congress on the Corps' ability to address urban flooding, an issue of increasing importance given global climate change and sea level rise. This report was due to Congress not later than one year after enactment, but two and a half years later, I still do not have my report. If confirmed, will you commit to updating me on this effort within your first month uh, as Assistant Secretary? Yes, Senator, if I'm confirmed, I commit to updating you on that report. Thank you. Um, given your previous work on Western water issues, you no doubt can appreciate a bureaucratic pickle when you see one. Unfortunately, and I love pickles, but not this kind. Uh, unfortunately, I have another one for you. The Chicago District's Bubbly Creek project on the south branch of the Chicago River. At question is whether or not the Corps can secure the liability protections needed to advance a cleanup of this contaminated area. In the interest of time, I won't delve into the specifics of this case, but the two federal agencies with a role in this matter, the Corps of Engineers and the US EPA, do clearly do not see eye to eye on the problem and therefore have not identified a workable solution. One agency believes this is a policy issue. The other agency believes this is a statutory issue. Will you commit to picking up the phone in the first two weeks following your confirmation and calling EPA Administrator Regan to address this impasse. Yes, Senator, you have my commitment if I'm confirmed to move forward with that. Uh, removing bureaucratic hurdles to make progress is uh, something I share um, a strong concern and appreciation for. Thank you. And that's 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 the aim is to remove the hurdle. I, I don't want to have any finger pointing. I just want to find a solution to this. Um, and very quickly, I have just a little over a minute, uh, just under two minutes left. Um, Mr. Connor, I just have a series of rapid fire questions. If confirmed, will you commit to reinforcing the importance of the Inland Waterways User Board with Secretary Austin and help to expedite his review so the board can be reactivated as quickly as possible? Yes, if yeah. I will work with you on that, yes. Thank you. And Word of 2020 includes several provisions reinforcing the core support for Chicago's shorelines. If confirmed, will you commit to updating me on these efforts within the first month on the job? Yes, I will, Senator. Thank you. Section 133 of Word of 2020 authorizes the Corps to repair and rehabilitate federal pump stations that are in disrepair. If you are confirmed, I would like a list of pump stations on the upper Mississippi River that the Corps plans to prioritize. Will you commit to providing me with this list within a month of your confirmation? Senator, yes. Senator. If confirmed, I'll provide you with that list. Thank you. And finally, <laughs> will you commit to visiting Illinois as, uh, soon and touring some of our critical infrastructure projects? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed the commitment. Well, you commit to coming out to Illinois and touring some of our infrastructure projects. I promise to get you some sweet corn while you're out. <laughs> yes, Senator, I commit to doing that. Wonderful. Thank you. And I look forward to speaking with you again tomorrow. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. I yield back. That is a sweet corn to the rest of us, uh, Senator. <laughs> we'll find it. It's a deal, Mr. Chairman. You gave me extra time. <laughs> Okay, uh, we've been joined by Senator Padilla and Senator Markey in, in that order. And uh, Senator Padilla, you're recognized in Dan Eddy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Connor, good morning. I uh, want to start by saying how grateful I am that someone with your experience uh, with water and drought issues in California specifically is being nominated for this position. Uh, as I mentioned to you by phone yesterday, your reputation precedes you. And uh, I want to point out uh, what an accomplishment it is. 
uh, is to be so uh, widely respected in California uh, water world across a variety of stakeholders. So if that's an indicator for uh, how you'll do in this uh, position, uh, we have a high, high expectation. Uh, you know, the Army Corps has been a great partner, uh, not just to the state of California as a whole, but specifically to my hometown of Los Angeles since devastating flood events in the 1930s prompted the federal government to assist Los Angeles County specifically in developing and expanding flood control infrastructure. Uh, the Sepulveda Dam, for example, along with Hanson Dam and the Lopez Dams in the San Fernando Valley, which is literally my backyard, uh, provide vital risk management of portions uh, of the Los Angeles River. And I look forward to continuing to work with you on these projects, particularly as there's this re-envisioning uh, and uh, recreation of what the Los Angeles River should uh, should should be capable of uh, while it continues its uh, uh, flood control uh, purposes. Uh, while I enjoyed our discussion yesterday by phone, I was also pleased to hear that uh, climate resiliency is a top priority for you. And with California facing an unprecedented drought and heat wave combined, literally as we speak, the increased resiliency of our water infrastructure will be a top priority of mine. Look forward to having the, uh, someone that uh, uh, has the familiarity and experience with California in the Assistant Secretary's office. I know there's other issues that I wanted to raise that have been asked already, so I'll just add one specific topic. Uh, as you know, and as we discussed yesterday, the Scripps Institute of Oceanography has been working for years together with the Corps, with the state of California, with the coalition of water districts, particularly in Southern California, as well as researchers to better integrate storm monitoring into how the Army Corps regulates water releases from dams throughout the state. It simply makes no sense that rigid water control manuals require dam operators to release water during a drought simply because a decades-old water control manual says so. There is now wide support amongst the uh, California delegation for the Corps to take into account modern hydrology and precipitation forecasts into its dam operations, especially as we face increased variability, uh, variability in rainfall. We've already started seeing the benefits of this, uh, both at uh, Lake Mendocino in Northern California, as well as the Prado Dam in Southern California. So uh, with the time remaining, just to ask if you can speak to the importance of the Forecast Inform Reservoir Operations Program and the need to update our water control manuals in the face of uh, increasing variability in precipitation and the cycle of drought and flooding that we uh, are facing in California. Senator, thank you for that question. I very much enjoyed the discussion yesterday. Um, I absolutely agree that looking at resiliency, looking at a changing environment um, that improved forecasting, monitoring, uh, operations uh, is, is absolutely critical. Uh, we've been operating under rules that were developed in a time where the environment no longer reflects the assumptions that were made in putting together those rules. Uh, this was a discussion that we had with the Corps when I was at the Bureau of Reclamation and the Department of the Interior. It's obviously con con continuing. I think this is a great place to get the most bang for the buck, making the investments in those technologies, forecasting and monitoring, uh, so that we can integrate those into operations, improve water supply or protection of communities if we can better forecast those extreme events. Uh, and make progress while we're looking on the, for the whole array of solutions that have to be in place. Some of those are infrastructures, a lot of them are natural infrastructure, uh, but we can't forget technology and our ability to manage water using information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator, Senator Padilla, thanks uh, so much for joining us. Senator Markey, good to see you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Conniff, for your willingness to uh, serve. So we have a big issue up in Massachusetts on Cape Cod. The Bourne and Sagamore bridges uh, were built in the 1930s as part of a Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, Works Progress Administration plan. 
and they've aged out. And we need to replace these two bridges. And it's very important because 250,000 people who live on Cape Cod are dependent upon those bridges. And during the summer, that number can double, triple, or quadruple mm -hmm. the number of people who use those bridges. And the Army Corps of Engineers um, operate these bridges. They're the ones who are responsible for them. So we need to replace them. And um, they are um, absolutely critical to the long-term well-being of our Commonwealth. The Army Corps specifically signed a memorandum of understanding with the Massachusetts Department of Transportation back in July of 2020, formalizing a federal state partnership to deliver two new bridges uh, for the people of Cape Cod. Implementing this agreement uh, will fall now to the Biden administration and to the Army Corps. And every year which we delay is going to lead to more traffic, more costs, uh, more danger uh, when uh, inevitable storms strike the region. So, uh, Mr. Connor, are you willing to work with us, the Army Corps, in order to make sure that we are able to uh, replace the born and the Sagamore uh, and to create for the 21st century a, a guaranteed capacity for people to get, get access uh, on and off of Cape Cod? Senator Markey, I'm, I'm not previously familiar with this project, but given its importance, as you've outlined, I am happy to work with you uh, in moving forward and seeing what we can do to ensure that that project is uh, taken care of. Right. Well, thank you. And, and again, it is um, it's something that requires the chairman uh, and the other members of Congress here to provide additional federal funding. And we're working hard on that in order to make sure that for that project and for so many other projects uh, in the country that we have a capacity to work on it. And just following up on what um, Senator uh, Copper and Senator Whitehouse talked to you about, about coastal uh, protections, um, Delaware, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, but all of us are seeing rising tides. Um, we're seeing uh, massive erosion. Uh, we're seeing intensification of the storms which are impacting us. Uh, in New England, we have the second fastest warming body of water on the planet. After the Arctic, we're second in the Gulf of Maine. And that's Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island. And so that warming is causing tremendous uh, danger being created. So we want to work with you in order to make sure that we deal with these issues. For example, um, under a business as usual scenario over the course of this section, uh, uh, century, for the city of Boston, the sea rise could go as high as seven additional feet if we don't take uh, action. Uh, so from our perspective, we need uh, help. And uh, in light of those concerns, could you explain how, uh, again, following up on Senator Copper and Senator Whitehouse, how you're going to enhance uh, comprehensively and expand the capacity of the Army Corps to combat these threats to coastal communities in the United States? Thank you, Senator. Overall, my approach in thinking through how, if confirmed, I would want to uh, approach the huge number of needs uh, versus the resources. One, I, I, I discussed this earlier a little bit. Uh, <laughs> given that backlog of need out there, uh, I'm certainly hopeful and appreciative of the fact that Congress and working with the President are, are looking at the infrastructure investments that can be made. Uh, but Assessing the risks out there, the vulnerable vulnerabilities uh, that exist are going to be a high priority uh, in assessing how to prioritize the resources we do have. And so understanding uh, the risk associated with the body of water that you talked about, the energy involved in a warming body of water and the storm surges that that's going to cause, that's going to be a very high priority because I think that's fundamental to being effective in allocating resources and addressing resiliency is to best understand the risks uh, involved. And so I'm very happy to, to delve more deeply into the issues that you're talking about as others in assessing the coastal risk versus inland risk, et cetera, and trying to make the good judgments about where to invest resources. Yeah, one of the uh, concerns obviously that we have and I've been working with the Army Corps on developing a comprehensive study uh, for addressing Boston's climate 
resiliency. We are right in the crosshairs uh, of, uh, of this climate crisis. It's coming right for us. Uh, and again, we're going to need to work with the Army Corps so that we put in place the protections which we need. Um, the same thing is true, by the way, for Newburyport. Uh, Newburyport, Plum Island, uh, it's just so vulnerable right now. Uh, th the numbers are, are scary. 20% of Newburyport falls within FEMA's 100-year flood zone with the risk exacerbated even further uh, for the oceanfront residents. And uh, so that's why I'm, I've been pushing the Army Corps uh, to urgently address worsening shoreline erosion uh, in that vulnerable community as well. And I want to work with you uh, on the Newburyport issue uh, because, again, it's not their fault that the ocean is warming right off of their coastline. Uh, any one of these storms could have absolutely catastrophic uh, consequences. Uh, if, um, if, if, if uh, Hurricane Sandy had just moved a few more degrees, we'd still be digging out on Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket and in the city of Boston, Newburyport, uh, we'd still be recovering from it. It would be catastrophic. So uh, we we want to make sure that uh, we undertake additionally critical work to shore up the um, the seawalls that can that can prevent these uh, surging tides. And, and this committee also has a concomitant responsibility to ensure that we're funding the solutions to this climate crisis and. Under the leadership of the chairman, we are going to be doing that this year, uh, but we're going to need to partner with you uh, at the Army Corps. We are totally dependent on you in the state of Massachusetts. Absolutely, Senator. I look forward to working with you on these issues if I'm confirmed. Thank you so much, and uh, and we're looking forward to working with you as well. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for, um, for um, giving me that. Yeah, no, you bet. Thank, I should thank you, and I do. All right. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll have... Uh, well, any of our other colleagues to, to join us, Senator Capito has gone off to the Appropriations Committee, I believe, and um, uh, Senator Sullivan's trying to get here. We'll see if he makes it. In the meantime, I have about 14 more questions. <laughs> no, not really. Got several more, though. Several more. I hope you're doing, are you doing all right? I'm doing all right, Senator. My time is your time, Senator. Very good. I want to give uh, great credit to your wife and daughter for st sticking here and, and uh, supporting you through... Uh, through this grueling uh, examination, so this is uh, this is a friendly. I don't know if you can tell. This is a, friend, a friendly hearing. We we have some that aren't quite as friendly, but this is an encouraging thing. Uh, but uh, a couple more questions, if I, if I if I may, maybe one of them dealing with relationship uh, with O M B. Very often on, on this committee, we hear from multiple sources, as you might imagine, about the sometimes tense relationship uh, between the core and the Office of Management and Budget. Um, there's uh, a lack of transparency about how the Assistant Secretary of the, uh, the Army for Civil Works and core recommendations for a proposed budget are considered by OMB. And many times, uh, senators, and you heard a little of this today, many times senators feel that these recommendations are ignored or even overridden by OMB. Um, this is what happens uh, time and time again on equity between coastal and, and inland funding. Uh, my question is this, how, how might you, as Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works, improve the relationship with OMB and bring a bit more transparency to the budget process? Thank you, Senator. I think it's a huge, uh, I mean, it's an important question and it's a huge issue. And it's, I say that because it's one I'm very experienced in during my part, tenure at the, both running the Bureau of Reclamation and the Department of the Interior as its CEO, um, working with OMB and trying to have my priorities be its priorities uh, involved a lot of patient dialogue. Um, wasn't always successful, but I will say that through that process of engagement and um, not challenging, but wanting to go back and have discussions when uh, decisions were made that were not reflecting the priorities that I thought should be in place, I found was very productive uh, with, o with folks at OMB. Uh, having the staff that would work for me engage the staff at OMB and then taking it up and having this, the discussions at the leadership level when things were teed up. It's uh, a process that sometimes you can make immediate progress on certain issues, 
Uh, I'm happy to say that some of the things that we worked on in 2014, 2015, 2016 didn't see the light of day until this most recent budget, but clearly they got internalized at some point, some of the uh, Indian water rights initiatives at Interior, et cetera. So we can make progress in the uh, short term through engagement and we can maintain progress and hopefully build on that in future. And that's what we need to do. And uh, if I'm confirmed, you have my commitment to engage in that process. I think it's just critical for the Army Corps of Engineers. It's critical for members of Congress to understand how decisions are being made and I think at the end of the day, it leads to better decisions with the allocation of budget resources. I think you're right. Um, second question, uh, uh, stakeholders and uh, sponsor uh, collaboration with the Ar Army Corps of Engineers is a critical component in solving today's water resources challenges. Uh, it helps to limit the cost of missed opportunities. It promotes uh, better planning. It provides better transparency and results in more fiscally and environmentally sound projects. The Corps, unfortunately, has been uh, limited in its outreach methods to promote stakeholder development in uh, a number of disadvantaged communities. And uh, my question is, uh, what more could or should the Corps be doing in terms of collaboration with non-federal stakeholders, including those in disadvantaged communities? Uh, Senator, it's a huge challenge from Corps, not because I think uh, there's not a commitment there, but just given the oversubscribed nature of the projects and the works that are already in place. And quite frankly, I've had this, uh, these discussions with uh, General Spellman at a very high level at this point in time about the challenges to the workforce itself in doing the work that's uh, it's expected to do. And so notwithstanding all of those demands, uh, I see, and I think the core in my uh, discussion so far certainly sees the direction that's being given by Congress to do the outreach to disadvantaged communities, to look at cost benefit differently, to carry out pilot projects that will allow them to engage uh, in those projects and bring the, the talents and the expertise and the protections and the value of the projects that the Corps can work on with those communities. Uh, they see it, I see it, and it will be a high priority in this next administration. And my sense is that there will be resources allocated specifically in this area. Uh, and with that, uh, there's no excuse for not moving forward in trying to engage with these communities. All right, thank you. Um, we talked uh, a bit uh, in a conversation earlier this week about natural infrastructure, using natural infrastructure. Uh, where can nature-based infrastructure as opposed to man-made infrastructure as an integral part of the Corps' project delivery process. Uh, Congress has been uh, very clear about moving these concepts forward, but the, uh, the incorporation of these features into water resources project is still the, the exception rather than, than the rule. How might you, as Assistant Secretary of the Army or Civil Works, ensure that Corps planning and engineering standards are updated to incorporate, the, incorporate these principles into the normal project delivery process. Thank you, Senator. I think uh, what I can do from my position, if I'm confirmed, is to prioritize the need to integrate uh, nature-based solutions, natural infrastructure, wherever we can and wherever it makes sense. And there's a direction that needs to be in place to always look at that option uh, and Two, to ensure that we understand all the options available. And once again, this is a discussions that I've had in preparation for these hearings is the need for more research and development in this area. We know in some cases where we can move forward. The beneficial use of dredge material, I think, is one of those opportunities. The integration in coastal productions of natural materials as well as traditional uh, concrete and uh, brick and mortar type infrastructure I think has been used. Um, but clearly from a cost efficiency standpoint and an opportunity standpoint, we need to do more of that. In looking at flood risk management and looking at trying to slow down water in various ways, how do we build more backwaters? How do we build more access to floodplains? Uh, not only to get the benefits of the protections, but to infiltrate you know, groundwater, depleted groundwater aquifers. Uh, that are necessary for water supply, that are necessary for their cooling effects later on in the year, in the summer, when water flows dip, 
Uh, there are just so many opportunities to integrate these natural solutions and get multiple benefits uh, that it will be a high priority to ensure we're always looking at it and a high priority to better understand through research and development and pilot projects how we can move forward with those type of uh, that integration. All right, thanks. Thank you uh, for, your, uh, for your response. That's an important issue to, uh, to us and uh, the first state and, and to a lot of our other states as well, as you, as you know. Uh, probably my last question of uh, this morning uh, will deal with the, uh, the core budget and uh, s subject that others have, uh, have raised already. You've commented on it too. And, uh, and once uh, I've asked a question, you've answered it. If no one else joins us, uh, Senator Sullivan's trying to. We'll see if he can make it. But if he doesn't, then um, I'll ask you if there's anything you want to say. Just to, uh, there he is. Good. All right. Colonel, Colonel, welcome aboard. Uh, I, uh, uh, I'm going to, uh, you, you back. If, if you're ready, I'll, I'll, I can, uh, Danny, I can just yield to you now. I've been joined by I, Sen I'm ready. Senator Sullivan from the great state of Alaska. Mr. Connor, thank Retired you. Retired Marine Thanks. Colonel. Retired Thanks Marine for Colonel. waiting. Uh, sorry about my uh, late arrival here, but we had an opportunity to ask some questions yesterday in front of the Armed Services Committee, so you get you get two rounds. So what we call a double shot of baby's love. With apologies <laughs> but, to Junior Walker and the All-Stars. <laughs> I appreciate it. Let me, uh, again, I appreciated our discussion the other day. Let me let me go into this one topic that I think is actually a very important one. Um, the budget that the president put forward for the Corps of Engineers effectively prohibits funding for Army Corps projects that, quote, facilitate the transportation of fossil fuel products. Now, you and I kind of did a quick little back of the envelope estimate. That's probably at least 50% of all Corps of Engineer projects. Let me, um, let me uh, give one example. I know that in the Boston area, they import a lot of LNG from Russia. Very bad policy, by the way, the state of Massachusetts. They'd rather import gas from Russia, our adversary, than Americans who produce gas in Pennsylvania. As far as I can tell, this reading wouldn't allow you to dredge Boston Harbor or do any work there. Do you agree with this? And what do you think the implications are of a policy that prohibits the Corps from any any project that transports fossil fuels? Uh, Senator Sullivan, I appreciate the discussion, the heads up on this particular matter when we talked the other night. Uh, I don't believe that's a policy. I, I did uh, go and find the language that I think you're referring to. I'm not 100% uh, sure, but my, my understanding was that in the budget there was language talking about uh, considerations made in the development of the budget, of which one of those was to limit the subsidies that the Corps would provide for oil and gas, uh, facilitating oil and gas operations. So first of all, I understand it was uh, a discussion about the consideration. It was essentially directed towards subsidies. And moreover, it was uh, with, it's a policy document in which there was this language trying to explain how the overall budget was developed. Uh, and so from that standpoint, I don't believe that is the policy, that it has the breadth of issues that we, you and I, were discussing the other night. But second of all, I can just assure you that in making decisions about how to allocate resources, uh, I'm going to be focused on uh, the applicable statutes, laws that apply, the appropriations provided by Congress, and the direction on how to use those appropriations. Uh, and that's going to... Um, as I see it, uh, and I s did go through the budget uh, after we talked, it's directing that a lot of these activities related to commerce and ports and waterways and transportation needs uh, are going to continue in, in full force. So let me just read some of the language. It says, no funding for work that directly subsidizes fossil fuels, including work that lowers the cost of production, lowers the cost of consumption, or raises revenues retained by producers of fossil fuels. So do you agree with that? Well, that's a little bit different language that I've, than I've seen. That's, uh, I'm reading the budget. Right. No, I, I understand that uh, I need to, to go back and look at that specific language. Again, I, look, I'm a huge believer in what the Corps does. 
Their mission is to build things. A lot of what they do is transportation. A lot of what they do is pipelines. A lot of what they do, we still need energy in America. There's a far left element of the Biden administration that thinks we can get rid of fossil fuels. We can't. Okay, we can't. You'll crush the economy. By the way, there's a lot of discussion of union jobs in here. You'll kill millions of union jobs. The president's already pretty good at that. So I just need your commitment that this kind of policy makes no sense. And it's a huge, huge component of the work that the Corps of Engineers does. Right now, the president's budget is telling and directing you, you can't do a lot of the work that you traditionally do. And I just think it's a really big issue, Mr. Chairman, that we need to look at um, in detail. A number of us are going to be writing on the head of OMB in the next day or two to ask direct questions about this topic. But can I get your commitment to work with me and others in this committee who care about the delivery of energy and the men and women who produce it, many of whom are union members, and not discriminate, particularly with regard to the Corps' mission on projects that help us deliver energy to Americans, particularly when gasoline prices right now are skyrocketing, hurting working families. This is all going to contribute to that. And I'd like your commitment to work with me and this committee on this topic. It's a really, really important topic. I don't think it's a partisan topic. I don't think EPW members want to have a policy that says you cannot help with the transportation or consumption of energy. We need energy in America. I know some of the far left Green New Dealers don't think we do, but we do. Can I get your commitment on that? You have my commitment to work with you, this committee as a whole, to carry out the Corps' mission to continue to do those projects um, and maintain waterways and to continue to rehabilitate. How about, how about pipelines? And pipelines, we will move forward with our permitting responsibilities uh, consistent with the Clean Water Act, be transparent, uh, and be uh, do the full analysis. And I'm happy to continue uh, to work with you in those areas and to continue that work in the way it's directed under the existing laws. Great. Mr. Chairman, may, may I ask one final question? Yes. Uh, I'd ask you to be brief. I think we're about to start voting. I want to ask one more question myself. Um, I just want to, um, we had a really good discussion uh, the other day. And again, I appreciated the, all the time that you had in my office as it relates to um, permitting. And again, I think that uh, this is pretty much a bipartisan issue. We had some good language on permitting reform here in this committee when we marked up the highway bill. Um, the core has a kind of can-do mission-oriented focus on building things. But when it takes nine years to permit a bridge or nine to 19 years to permit and build a highway in America, those are averages, um, it really, really undermines our ability to pe put people to work and build the infrastructure you need, we need as a country. Can I get your commitment to work with this committee? You and I had a good discussion about this on permitting reform, not to cut corners, but to get to projects in an efficient, timely manner. And as you know, and Mr. Chairman, we've talked about in this committee, if we have efficient, timely permitting, we're also going to be able to get millions, billions of dollars off the sidelines and from the private sector that will invest in these kind of infrastructure projects. But they won't invest if it's a 10-year permitting timeline. Can I get your commitment to work with us, this committee and me, on those important issues? Uh, Senator, yes, absolutely. This will be a high priority to do our part, if I'm confirmed, to make our permitting system more efficient and that means collaborating, coordinating with other agencies that are involved, and getting even to another place that you and I talked about, mitigation banking and other opportunities. When you bring those in and you create more opportunities to deal with the impacts of projects, I think that also helps to address, uh, creates at least the opportunity to do permitting more efficiency and move it forward. So I'm a big fan of the federal government working with others to be more efficient in this process. That's a long-winded answer to your question. Yes, uh, you have my commitment. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for joining us.
you're worth waiting for. <laughs> uh, Mr. Connor, uh, one one last question, if I if I could. Uh, have you ever heard of a, a comic strip Pogo? <laughs> Pogo. Yes, sir, I have. Uh, yeah. The uh, one of I think one of the scripts was uh, Pogo would say, "We have met the enemy, and it is us." About the enemy and it is us. When I hear uh, uh, my colleagues and I ask questions about the, the level of of uh, funding for the for the Army Corps to do its m uh, many many different uh, works uh, across the country, I'm reminded of Pogo. And uh, but as you know, the the Congress uh, typically funds the the Army Corps of Engineers at uh, levels actually above the president's request. I think in. Uh, fiscal 21 requests the last president, last administration. Their request was um, something uh, just under six billion dollars, a lot of money. Congress ended up providing, uh, it was not nearly enough, and Congress ended up providing close to eight billion dollars for that, uh, for the current fiscal year. And while those numbers uh, appear to be large, they are uh, large. The Corps has not made a significant dent in the project backlog. Uh, estimated to be nearly uh, $109 billion. And some observers have said the Corps needs an even larger investment of up to $140 billion when the full scope of project needs are considered. Uh, will you, if confirmed, will you advocate and, and, and just work with us, work with, with this committee uh, to see if we can't uh, convince uh, this new administration to uh, help us increase the, the Corps' budget to support core missions and local needs. As you know, as budget process, president's request, and the Congress's debate and, and then appropriate monies, it would be helpful to have an administration which actually know, is aware of this need and to make sure that when they prepare and offer their budgets in the future, it's reflective of those needs. Uh, would you, uh, uh, made, made a lot of commitments today, but I'm asking if you would would uh, commit to advocate and work with us to increase the Army Corps' budget to support the needs, many needs and the missions that the Corps is expected to meet, would you? Mr. Chairman, if I'm confirmed, you have uh, my full commitment to uh, elevate these issues, uh, discuss them rigorously within the administration and work with you uh, and the committee members in that effort. Um, I'm happy to do that. All right, thank you. Uh, I, I, I indicated uh, a bit earlier that uh, I give you uh, a little bit of time right here at the end. If anything else you'd like to say, just uh, in summarizing. Uh, no, sir. I think I've said enough today. <laughs> <laughs> My thanks to, to you for your willingness. Let me see if I have. Hold on just one second, please. Um, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Thank you for your willingness to serve our, our nation. Uh, we're proud of our committees. Uh, and, and our thanks again to, to your, your family, to your wife and to your daughter for, uh, for your, you, you serve too. It's, it's not just your husband, not just your dad. But uh, we are proud uh, on this committee of our, our uh, really a record of bipartisanship. I'd like to say that we're workhorses here in this committee, not, not show horses. I'm delighted that uh, the record has been demonstrated by our consideration of the president's nominees for this uh, Congress. And today's hearing continues that effort, and we look forward to hearing more from you in the the days and the weeks ahead. Uh, when since Senator Capito has had to leave, she sends her best, and uh, and joins me in thanking you for for coming today and for all your responses. We uh, before we adjourn, a little bit of housekeeping. I want to. I uh, ask unanimous consent to submit for the record a variety of materials that include letters from stakeholders, other materials that relate to today's nomination hearing. Senators will be allowed to submit questions for the record through the close of business on Friday, July 16th. That's this Friday. We'll uh, compile those uh, questions and send them to our witnesses, ask that you reply to them by next Wednesday, July 21st. And uh, with that, this hearing is mercifully 